Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is cosmologist Delia Perlov. Welcome, Delia. Hi, Brian. <laughs> um, and Delia is a theoretical physicist cosmologist. And so I generally I start a lot of these conversations uh, that I'm not the brightest bulb in the room, and that's certainly the case today. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and so um, I hope that my questions make sense. Um, and if they don't, please correct me. Okay. And as we're having a conversation, if you say something I don't understand, which will probably be most of the time, I will interrupt you and ask you to slow it down. No problem. And Delia <laughs> has a book, Cosmology for the Curious, which was written uh, with Alex Belenkin, correct? Correct, correct. And I've read it twice through, <laughs> but I can't claim to be an expert on any of it, although it is interesting. So I thought it'd be fun to have Delia in for a conversation. Delia is a cosmologist, theoretical physicist, teacher, research, writer, um, and a uh, skilled artist <laughs> and pianist, right? Uh, I don't know about skilled, but I try. I dabble. So what is your, if you had to define yourself, mm -hmm. what is, so cosmology is part of theoretical physicists? So would you say, if you're at a dinner party and someone says, oh, Delia, what do you, what do you probably yeah. don't even tell yeah. them, right? Because well, first I say I'm a physicist, because if I say I'm a cosmologist, what they hear is cosmetologist. Right, and then they start they asking, start asking me about makeup and stuff like that. So first I say I'm a physicist, and then if they ask more, I'll go into what kind of a physicist. So then I'll say a cosmologist. And then if there are further questions, I'll say, well, a cosmologist is someone who studies the origin of the universe and its large-scale evolution. Is theoretical physicist synonymous with cosmologist? You get different kinds of theoretical physicists, but um, you can be like an observational cosmologist or an experimental cosmologist or a theoretical cosmologist, but you can also be a different kind of theoretical physicist. So. The theori being a theoretical physicist means that basically you use equations and the theories of physics and you calculate things with a pen and paper, maybe a computer, as opposed to, say, working in a lab or observing at a telescope. So it's more theoretical. It's using the theory and you come up with ideas and you try to work out the consequences and um, best case scenario, somebody goes and checks it with an experiment. So they would be an experimental physicist. Oh, okay. So you come up with an idea, and it's up to someone else to do the work and see if everything you did makes sense. So you predict or come up with a theory that hopefully yeah, will get tested. Yeah, like theoretical physicists would maybe say, based on some mathematics and um, pre-existing physics, maybe they'll predict that a particle exists. This would be like a a particle, a theoretical particle physicist might exist that might, might, might predict that there should be a particle with a given mass and charge and then the, um, the, the experimentalists will design an experiment and try and see if that's true and if you're lucky they'll detect the particle that you predicted like the Higgs boson was predicted, uh, sure I forget exactly but more than 50 years ago and um, there was a particle that was predicted to exist and they sort of had a calculation showing sort of what mass it should have. And then it took decades and decades of thousands of physicists working together and they built this huge accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, and eventually they did detect this particle. And um, so, so, that's, so there's this sort of um, interplay between theoretical physicists and experimental physicists. They, they go together. Sometimes you make the prediction um, and then the experimentalists go out and look for it, and sometimes experimentalists find something and they need an e explanation, and hopefully oh, the really? theorists will come up with a good theory. So yeah. an experimental physicist could find something and then need it defined? They could, something well, you, I, something could a... be observed or found in an experiment, and th there's the existing theories can't accommodate it, and then they have to enlarge the theories. Oh, interesting. And so if someone makes a prediction and it gets later it later gets tested so with the Higgs boson part of it was technology problem right Huge. because there was no way to test the prediction until well, yeah 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 no it's it's a huge technological feat and i mean an, another example and that's not the before you go on too far that's not the only thing that's been detected of course so the it, the, the whole project has been um, a wealth of information yes okay yes I mean, another example is um, 100 years ago, Einstein developed his theory of general relativity, which describes 
how gravity works. And Einstein described gravity as this curvature of space-time. Wait, wait, before you go on, <laughs> there's nothing I know. I don't know okay. anything. Okay. But I think this is one thing I was going to ask about. Mm -hmm. So before you explain it, because when you were saying prediction, so I, I, according to Einstein's prediction, light should, gravity should bend light yes. during the eclipse, right? And that, well, that was the way they tested it. That, that so now go on. This is all, okay, not, so I don't know yeah. anything about this, but it's familiar, and I'm great. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. So, 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 so do I look smarter now? No. So, Just kidding. Ready to get your PhD. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> um, so go ahead. So Einstein so, made this prediction so, so 100 he, years ago. So he, come, he, he developed the theory of general relativity. Like you mentioned, with light passing the sun, for example, if light from a distant star is coming close to the sun and it's heading towards us, the sun warps the space, technically the space and time around it and um, it alters the, the, the path of the light ray. So if there's a solar eclipse, you can take a photo of where the star is and you can compare it to other times when there is an eclipse where, where that star is and you can see that the light is deflected. Anyway, that was shortly after Einstein came up with general relativity. Eddington led a, an expedition and they, they measured this um, deflection of light by the sun, okay? So that, that's what made Einstein so famous. He became a ha household name at that point. But he also predicted in his theory of gravity that um, the universe, like if say you have two objects, like a, two massive black holes that are rotating around each other. or um, two, So a black hole is basically, you say you have a star and it starts to die and it collapses and a lot of matter gets crammed into a very, very small, very small volume. Um, and if, if there's enough matter in a small enough volume, this object becomes a black hole. And what this means is that if, even if light tries to escape from this object, it, it can't. Like once you fall close... Slow down sorry. just for one second. So light gets deflected by the sun. You said the sun, but it's yes. the, the sun has mass, which gives it gravity. So it's the... Yeah. It's, it's right. And so the black hole collapsing, all... I'm sorry, the sun... Sorry, the star that dies and collapses, it takes with it all of its mass. So it's, it has all the gravity it had when it was a star? Well, some, some when, when stars die, I mean, some, of, some gas gets shed out into, in, into the interstellar space, which is really important because that recycles elements. And if, if, if stars didn't shed off um, mass into the interstellar region, then like, we wouldn't be made of, of heavier elements. But um, but whatever does remain, if the conditions are right, you can, you can create an object called a black hole, which is just an extreme, you just think of it as a, as a very, very dense object that um, has an incredibly strong gravitational field around it. So um, what, what Einstein, one of his predictions from general relativity was, for example, let's say you had two black holes rotating around each other um, and they're spiraling in towards one another and they're about to collide this will disturb what's called space-time, the fabric of space-time, and it will send out a ripple, sort of like a ripple on a pond when you throw a pebble in, and it will send out a ripple. It dis it, it's, a, it's a distortion of space-time that travels at the speed of light. So Einstein predicted these, these gravity waves. So, um, he, but the, the effect of these, these ripples on space-time is, is tiny, so it's very, hard to observe and he thought of this effect would never be observable but it was, it's a prediction of the theory you can't have the theory and not have this prediction and um, a few years ago you know after decades and decades of building these these huge um, uh, apparatus called laser in, uh, called interferometers uh, we, we were able to observe gravitational waves that that left um, in some cases they left where they were created about over a billion years ago. They've been traveling through space and they finally like washed over the earth and were detected by our detectors. And um, Einstein would be very happy, but it's, it's, it's sort of like um, the, being able to see these gravitational waves is, is like being able to detect a hair that's four light years away. And you know, light travels very fast. It, it travels at about 300,000 kilometers per second. And if you travel at that speed for four years, you get the distance of four light years. I mean, it's just trillions and trillions of kilometers. Um, so if you had like a, 
the width of a human hair that far away and you could detect that's the level of the distortion that these gravitational waves cause in the instruments and, and we were able to detect that. And so it's, so general, the prediction of light deflection or diffract, mm -hmm. what was it? Deflection. Deflection um, was observed mm -hmm. and gravitational waves were a second prediction but that just further supports it further supports. But you didn't really need it because the deflection he didn't need is it. enough? The, well, the deflection was one thing. There was also um, a calculation of what's called the perillion, the precession of Mercury's orbit. So Mercury orbits around the sun in an ellipse, as do all the other planets. Um, but the sort of, the ellipse precesses. Right. I've and it takes, it takes a long time to do that. I didn't mean to, to say right that. as if I'm agreeing with you. I mean, yeah. yeah, I think I've read that. It takes, a, it, takes a, it takes a long time to, to process. The precision rate is very, very small. Um, and Einstein, using general relativity, calculated how many arc seconds, is a t that's a tiny angular measurement, how many arc seconds Mercury um, would be deflected by in a century. And that matched the observations perfectly. So there was the... the Precession of Mercury, there was light deflection, and, and various other things that ha had already been um, well tested. I mean, people have been testing general relativity and its predictions, its gravitational time delay, which is something else. And um, so all these things have been tested. One huge prediction ha was these, that these, there should be gravitational waves, um, and now we have observed them. But he, Einstein never thought it would be possible because it's such a tiny effect. So basically, if, if imagine I have a ring. So okay? what you're saying a gravitational wave is a tiny effect. So if one washed mm. through this room right now, I mm. wouldn't have to worry it's going to throw you across the room or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds so, yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. science fiction. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, the, 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 so when a gravitational wave passes through space, it, it distorts it, it really distorts space-time. So I've, I've mentioned space-time a few yeah. times. Maybe I should just say a little bit about that. Perhaps, like From yeah. a Newtonian point of view, we're used to thinking... Newtonian? Of, as in Newton. Yeah, no, no, I just wanted to make sure I heard that correctly. Yes, no, Newtonian, yes. okay. We, we always thought of space as being sort of like up and down and forwards and backwards, you know, you know our spatial dimensions. And we thought of time as sort of just ticking along every second, you know, just absolute time and absolute space, and they were two separate things. And then Einstein came along and actually, before general relativity, he had this theory called special relativity, and he showed that actually space and time are much more interrelated, and it's really more correct to talk about space-time. So now, like, if you're trying to measure an interval in space, um, and somebody, let's say you have um, a friend who's going on a, a journey on a spaceship and your friend goes off and eventually comes back. You might have heard about this twin paradox, like say, say you, your, your twin is going on a journey um, and they zip off at close to the speed of light and then come back, also traveling at close to the speed of light. And then they come back and find that you've aged so much more than they have. And what, what Einstein showed was that like, how much time elapses or like the interval between two different events, it, it depends both on space and time, okay? It depends on your motion. The motion sort of mixes space and time. So, so in general relativity, space and time are mixed as well. So that's why I keep talking about space-time. And when you're talking about the twin experiment, that's something that we're not going to get close to. We. Don't anybody, I'm not, I use the pronoun we, but mm. it's not we, I don't know anything. It's something that experimental physicists are not going to get to, right? You can't put somebody in a spaceship and go the speed of light. You don't, yeah, yeah, but, but you, don't, have, you don't have to, though. But we still have to take into account special relativistic effects, which in, in, in all sorts of like GPS systems, for example, because when you're driving in your car and you're sending a signal to some satellites, there are a few satellites out there that are getting a signal, and, and there's, a, there's a timing mechanism. Your, your clock on your car has to be synchronized with the clocks on board the satellites and that's that's sort of how they know where you are um, and if they don't take into account the satellite that's moving in like a geosynchronous orbit it's moving quite fast and moving objects th their, their clocks tick slower okay so so it doesn't have to be the speed of light for it to tick, no, no, tick no. at a different no 
No, so this has been shown as well. Then. Okay. Yeah, and if you don't take that into account, then your clocks aren't going to be synchronized. And there is another kind of time dilation that comes from general relativity. So if the closer we are to the Earth's surface, the stronger we feel the Earth's gravity. Like if we went a billion light years away, we're not going to feel the Earth's gravity, right? Right. But um, and you don't have to go that far, right? You can just no, no. You just <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So let's say we go up a, a kilometer into the atmosphere, you can calculate. Oh, even a kilometer? No kidding. Well, you, you can you can calculate how much it is, but as well, you, you go can, up the the satellites um, are in a slightly weaker gravitational field. And actually, if you're in a stronger gravitational field, that slows your clock down. So their clocks are speeded up relative to ours because of this gravi general relativistic effect. But their clocks are slowed relative to us because they're orbiting. So both of these two effects have to be taken into account so that the timing between your car and, and the satellites is accurate so that yeah, okay. it can pinpoint your actual location and not be off. And, that's, be off. and having to do those calculations is another... Uh, observation of the of the prediction, right? Because well, it, when it, it, Einstein made the prediction or the general yeah. relativity calculations, nothing was moving that fast. There weren't any satellites. There weren't any. Yeah. But he still thought he he still thought about what would happen if you could travel next to a light beam. He did, so he could Einstein think about these, it all. He did these yeah thought experiments, <laughs> and he deduced a lot from his thought experiments. Let me ask you one question. Um, Totally aside, so is th was there another Einstein around? What do you mean? Well, a lot of times, um, I don't know if I should say a lot of times, but there are several people that are good at what they do. Right. Right, so he came up with this. Mm. Um, is that unusual? Do you think it would have been discovered anyway, is what I'm saying. So because um, um, you hear about Darwin, mm. and there was, I can't remember the other Wallace? fellows. Wallace, okay, yeah. was that it? Yeah, a think so. a, Not a competing theory, but yeah. another person right yeah. alongside yeah. him. Yeah. It, just the way things worked out in that time, I right. guess, people and were Newton starting to think Right, and Newton and Leibniz, they both invented calculus at the same time. Oh. They, were, they were enemies. And so is there um, another, well, <laughs> well, is there another Einstein? Or was they, there? Or? There, there were some, some physicists, Lawrence, Dutch physicist at the time, and he had these, um, so he basically had the mathematics of special relativity worked out. He had these transformations, and I, I might be leaving some others out there. Was That's okay, but there are others. But there were others, but, but they didn't, I mean, Einstein thought about it differently, and he had all those final sparks and put the whole thing together, the whole theory together. Um, but there were people who were very close, and there were people who had developed a lot of the mathematical formalism for special relativity. And maybe they would have gotten there. Some of the transformations in special relativity, um, or maybe all the transformations, the mathematical language was, was I, I believe I might be mistaken, but I think it was sort of sitting there. The, the field was right. Um, and Lawrence was a, a key player in that as well. Um, what was that name again? Lawrence, L-O-R-E-N-T-Z. Oh, is that the Lorentz factor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and with general relativity, well, there wasn't... Okay, stop, though, because you've, you've, you've switched from general to relative... You've general, special general, general, spe special, and then back to general. Yes, 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 because yes. <laughs> special relativity came first in 1905, and Einstein came up with special relativity, and he did that very quickly. And there he revolutionized... A, a few months, he was a, he was a clerk in a patent office Sounds in like Berlin. the names are reversed, then, because if you come up with something quickly, it should have been general, and then the next <laughs> one should be special, but yeah. go ahead. <laughs> um... So special relativity was first. All special right. relativity was first, and that's where he showed that like moving clocks run slower than stationary clocks. And he showed that, like, say I had a meter stick and it was s m flying past us really quickly, the meter stick would be contracted. That's Lawrence Fitzgerald contraction. So Lawrence and Fitzgerald already had like, you know, come up with this formalism, but. Um, Einstein really put it all together and, and realized how how motion affects our concepts of space and time. And then his old teacher, Minkowski, really put the two together in, in what's called Minkowski space-time. It really like merged space and time together. Einstein had a much more physical approach and he thought that, originally thought Minkowski's mathematics was like unnecessary, it was like superfluous. Oh. And then, but, but then when he was coming up with his general theory of relativity, 
he realized he couldn't do without the sort of like the, the more formal um, way that Minkowski had packaged it. And then he had to go further and, and get into all this um, other kind of mathematics and tensor mathematics. And so when he was trying to work on general relativity, but Einstein had the genius to come up like, with very basic, deep physical cornerstones. You know, he took the leap in special relativity and said that um, light, that it's the, the ultimate speed limit and, and any moving observers will always measure the same speed for the speed of light because, you know, if, if you're on a train and you see somebody running outside, you'll have some perception of what their velocity is. But if you're standing on the ground and not on a moving train, you would, you would think the velocity is different, right? Okay, and he yeah. said, like, however fast you're moving, you can be on a train and, you, and if you try to do an experiment to measure the speed of light, you're going to get the same value that someone who's not moving is going to get for the speed of light. So there, there okay, were things okay, that were Okay, let me break that down a little bit more, though, so I can understand this. <laughs> no, no, it's okay, because it's, it's, I don't know, maybe something's making sense. Let me move it from the train to something mm -hmm. that I have more experience with, which two cars driving. Right. So someone's driving 50 miles an hour, and I'm driving 70, I'm going to pass them. Yes. And so if you're standing on the sidewalk, you see me moving faster, and you see them, you see me moving 70 and them moving 50, but when I move past them, I see them moving slower than you're looking at them, and you're standing still to me. But if we all measure the speed of light, it's the same? Mm -hmm. So exactly. oh, if we observe each other, it looks different, but not the speed of light. Yeah. So that, that was a, a huge break with intuition, but he turned out to be well, right. I don't know if it's intuitive or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it took, like, it took an answer to, 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 to make that, that, that leap. So wait, let me ask another question then. Let me make it this even. Um, so let's speed these things up. So what's this? Say I'm going, uh, speed of light's 3,000 kilometers a second? 300,000. 300. So say I'm going 100,000 kilometers a second. Yes. And... I pass a car going 50,000 kilometers a second. Yes. If we both measure the speed of light, it'll still be 300,000? Mm -hmm. So because I'm going 100, it won't be 200? Mm -mm. So like, it, exactly. uh, not like, exactly. but back on the earth here, if I pass that, if I'm going 70 and I pass the car going 50, it's, go, it's not going 50 to me. To you, it's going 20, right? But the speed of light is different. Yes, exactly. Exactly. How does that, so, I guess I was going to say, how does that yeah. work? We can spend the whole segment talking about that, but we probably want to no. get to like the multiverse yeah, or something. Yeah, 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 okay. But, but, but Anson, anyway, we, we, we digress, but, but, but he, he was the one that had these, these, these genius leaps where, where he, he shook off things that everybody, all beliefs everybody thought were not questionable. And then with general relativity, he was almost beat to the, beat to the, um, to his, field equations by a mathematician called Hilbert. So that was very close, but I don't think he had the, in, anyway. So, Hilbert, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Einstein's a much cooler name. I, I guess it's like the when, when the whole field is ripe, that knowledge is almost there, but sometimes you need a, a, someone really, a, a great genius. So, to all right, we can get off of yeah, that. I yeah, just had yeah. a question if there were other Einsteins, and yeah. I, I guess there were. All right, let's get into your gig now. So I have a bunch of questions, but we probably chewed up a lot of the time already. So let's, I'll just skip ahead. May I? I'll look smart if I do this, right? Or older. Let's get right into your thing. And I don't want to, I'm going to ask one question with a lot of information in it all at once. Is that okay? Sure. Because as you can tell, I'm a layperson, right? I don't have any clue basically what you're talking about. Something just made sense, but it's gone already. <laughs> as the layperson, mm -hmm. I hear about all these different things. So uh, baby universes, inflation, um, I think there's something static universe, um, multiverses, bubble universes. Those are all cosmology theories, right? Theories and, and or consequences are and they, or ideas. Or they're all related mm -hmm. to the same area, your yes, area, right? Yes. Okay, let me put it that way. They're all yes. part of what you do. Yeah. So is there, out of all of that, can you dumb it down? Has anything been, have you guys settled on one of those? This is my question making any sense. So there's all yeah. these things I hear about that I don't understand. Mm. And you understand them. Mm. But are they all equally valid? Have, has everything been settled? So it, now you know there's a multiverse, or you know it's a bubbling universe, or you know that it's a static universe, or mm. you know you don't know well, anything? Well, it's definitely not static. OK, so something's been taken the off the table. The universe is expanding. The universe is expanding. Now, when, when did I'm, that go up? I guess that's OK, yeah. so Hubble 
Edwin Hubble. So static started. just means not expanding? Yeah. It's always been? Yes, oh, static. Just literally static. So Newton and the, up to Einstein. Einstein originally thought that the universe was static. I mean, when, when people looked at the skies, it, the, the sky looked the same, except for the planets that sort of wandered around the sky. And they didn't have the observations to, to, t to be able to like know anything different. So what you're saying, about, let me just clarify that for myself. So what you're saying, it looked static because we only lived so long, so we didn't see any changes and we didn't have the te telescopes to look out and see? Yeah, okay. yeah. It was only in the 1920s when it was discovered that most of the galaxies around us are moving away from us. And this was Edwin Hubble discovered that well, the universe is expanding. Well, let's back up just a little bit there, sorry. So most of the, you just said most of the galaxies around us. Now, yeah, how long, how when did that, we, uh, you know, it, it couldn't have been too much earlier that we only thought there was one galaxy, right? Right. So you jumped ahead already. Right, right. Like a hundred years ago, we didn't even know. So you had the Milky Way galaxy and people didn't know how large the Milky Way galaxy was. And then they saw like these little blotches of light, these little faint nebula. And um, there was this great debate um, about whether these nebulae were, these fuzzy patches, whether they were like um, part, of a, part of the Milky Way or if they were island universes in their own right. And um, ultimately it was discovered once Hubble was able to measure distances a little bit more accurately, um, it was discovered that there were these stars, these Cepheid variables that were like two plus million light years away and that was just so much larger than what they, how big they thought the Milky Way was. And indeed, you know, there, there are galaxies that are outside of our Milky Way, like hundreds of billions of them, but that was, they, they only discovered this roughly a hundred years ago. They didn't know that the, the faint patches with, in the sky were other, so other galaxies, galaxies in their own right. So other galaxies still static at that time? Yes, yeah, so, so okay, people so still thought, so they, they started to realize there were other galaxies, but they thought they were just there and they had always been there. And in fact, when Einstein came up with his theory of general relativity, he tried to, um, he tried to apply it to the universe as a whole. And what he found was that he had to add something to his equations to, to make the whole universe static because otherwise it would have collapsed in on itself. It would, would have been dynamic and, and it was so, it was just against the philosophy of the day. It was just ingrained that the universe sort of always was as, as it seemed. Oh, so it was ingrained that the universe was, the universe was static. Mm -hmm. General relativity showed that it wasn't static, so he had to, yeah. he had to say, well, had my, to I have to be wrong. Yes, and he put so in- So he thought he was wrong thought it was wrong and he put in something called the cosmological constant. Which I have heard and of. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then when when Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding because they measured the redshift of all these galaxies and found that they were moving away from us um, and the further galaxies were from us, the faster they were moving away, That's which is consistent weird. with this expansion. Um, after that, uh, Einstein went to visit Hubble and, and they went to the telescope and, and he reportedly said, you know, that adding the cosmological constant was the biggest blunder of his life because he could have predicted that the universe is expanding, but, but he didn't. He, he thought it was static and, and he even added an extra term to his beautiful equations to make it static. Um, and then that but, term got removed? So then they removed the term, but decades later, his cosmological constant actually has come back to haunt us. <laughs> oh no. And it turns out that in 1998 we discovered that the, the rate at which the galaxies are receding away from each other, instead of Wait, slowing down, receding away, moving away from each other. Right, so okay. the, on average all galaxies are moving away because the universe is expanding. So think of the surface of a balloon, imagine there's like a grid on the surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you blow up the balloon, and only think of the surface though, as you blow up the balloon, all points are going to get further and further away. All points on the grid are going to get further and further away from each other. That's like all the galaxies moving away. Oh. But okay. Um, or, or if, if and you so have, as they get further away, they actually get further away. Mm -hmm. Because they, they move faster. Because something close to me is going to expand less than something that's farther out on the balloon. Right. So the universe is like that. Wow. The universe is expanding. No, but I meant, okay, yeah, never mind. Yeah. 
And, and, and the further an object is, the faster it's expanding, because the expansion is uniform. So what I mean by that is, like, let, let's take a simpler case. Say you have a flat sheet. Imagine there's a grid on your piece of paper there, and you've got two dots that are like one meter away, or one centimeter away from each other, and then another dot that's two centimeters away from this one, right, from the, the primary dot. <laughs> if you double the whole sheet of paper, then this dot is now at two centimeters, but the one that was at two is now at four. So that one moved two centimeters in the same time as the other one moved one centimeter. So its speed is twice as much. Did yeah, okay. that make sense? All right. So um, anyway, so we're, we're talking we're, about we're, expanding universe. This yeah. brings Sorry, up something. I lost my That's okay, <laughs> but this brings up something interesting, which I'm sure is not correct, but. What is the universe, I don't, I'm sorry to ask this question, but what is the universe expanding in? Because if, is someone stretching the sheet? It's not, yes, like, yes, it's not expanding into anything. So if you have a balloon and you're blowing it up, that surface of the balloon is expanding into the space around the balloon, right? But with the universe, the space is all that there is, but it still stretches. It doesn't expanding in. It doesn't expand into like an empty volume. It generates more volume. So it's, it's, it's kind of tricky. Yeah. It's hard to it get your head, like a, a... head around it, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> but it, yeah. So, okay, I know where we were. So in 1998. Okay, so 1998, what they found was, okay, so, so when, when Hubble found that the galaxies are rushing away from each other, and you can take Einstein's equations and work them backwards. If the universe is expanding, you extrapolate backwards. Once it was denser, everything was much closer in the past. We know it's expanding, right? Everybody thought, well, depending on how much mass, the, any kind of mass or energy um, has a gravitational effect on the surrounding mass, okay? So everybody thought that the gravity would slow down this expansion, sort of like, it was almost exactly like if I take a ball and I throw it up, I can give it an initial velocity and it'll fly up, right? But the Earth's gravity is still acting on it. And it'll stop and come back down to Earth, okay? Unless I throw it at 11.2 kilometers per second, which is the escape speed from Earth, then it can go and leave the Earth's atmosphere and keep going. <laughs> okay. So the universe, with the expanding universe, depending on what the contents, how much matter there is in the universe, people didn't know, is the universe going to expand forever? That would correspond to, in this, if I'm throwing up a ball or a projectile, it would correspond to it like leaving the Earth's atmosphere and going off into space. Or... If there's enough matter, will, it th will the gravity of all the matter in the universe halt the expansion and it'll start to contract again in the future? That would be like if I just give the ball a little push and it goes up, stops, and gravity wins and it comes back down again. So this would be like the universe expanding, stopping, and coming back down. So people didn't know. So before you go too far with that, because I know there's something coming after it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't, if the matter will stop the expansion of the universe, why would it let it get started so much? You I need, mean, the universe is, how, I mean, it's so big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need a launching mechanism. As it turns out. A launching out, mechanism. Yeah. As it turns out. Oh, that overcomes the matter's yeah. pull. Yeah. But eventually, the matter will. It, wa it, it won't will, come Okay, back. okay. But it right won't. now, we we're still know. there. It, it depended didn't on, know, on how much material there is. And so, physicists. Uh, scientists, whatever, have been trying to measure how much stuff there is in the universe have been added for decades. And basically what, what we think at the moment is that the overall... So when you say measure stuff, you mean How me much and radiation, oh, how that much counts? matter. Radiation yes. has gravity? Yes. Man? And oh, actually the gravity. energy density, the amount of energy in a square centimeter, in every, or in every cubic inch, sorry, not a square centimeter, a cubic centimeter or cubic inch, the energy density of empty space contributes. And in fact, that's Einstein's cosmological constant, that if we went really far into the inter intergalactic medium and you just took a little cube of space, every little cubic centimeter of space has a tiny amount of energy, but it has some energy. And um, this actually causes a, a, a repulsive gravitational effect. 
Okay, I didn't mean to sidetrack you, so, so we're back. Are we back to it now? So the so, so now universe was expanding. It's 1998. The universe is expanding. It's 1998. People thought. Oh, they've been that, measuring all the, the matter. That, that, that the rate at which it's expanding is going to slow down. Okay, they right. think it's going to slow down. That makes sense. What they found is that it's actually speeding up so instead of slowing totally down. Totally unpredictable. Totally un. Not they, they were, totally they surprised. They were totally surprised. Everyone was surprised, except for a few people like Steven Weinberg and Alex Belenkin. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. They kind of made a prediction that it is possible that there is a small cosmological constant. Boy, I bet they so, didn't sleep that night then. They must have been throwing <laughs> big smiles on their faces. <laughs> so, um, Told you so. And, in, and in, in a way, this has become, in a sense, some sort of evidence that there might actually be other universes out there with different properties. Oh. And that's kind of confusing. Do you have a question about that? I'm sure I do, but mm -hmm. so let's finish this up first. Okay. So the universe is expanding, and it's not slowing down. It's getting faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so and that's, so what is that, how does that relate back to they've been measuring all the stuff in the universe trying to figure out how much it would slow down? So it's um, not, so the, the stuff in the universe is not pulling it slower. It's still speeding up. The, the regular matter in the universe, the, the gravity of the regular matter is like applying brakes to the expansion. Okay, but, but it's not enough. There's something happening but, here. The energy density of empty space, the vacuum energy density of the cosmological constant, um, is speeding up the expansion. And that is now the dominant effect. So now we live in a new era. So the universe has had a very So the breaking effect is not overcoming the acceleration effect. The acceleration is overcoming the breaking. The breaking. So there's this repulsive gravity that's acting in tandem with regular gravity, but the repulsive, we now live in an, an era of the universe where the, um, the repulsive gravity of the vacuum is dominant. Okay, so how does that go? So you're right, I do have a question about that. So where do you go from, how come all of a sudden that opens up the door to these other universes with different properties? So Does that make any sense? Like, yes, yes. So just because we're in an expanding universe and it's going faster, we thought it was we. Again, it's mm -hmm. not we. I didn't make any. It's not me. <laughs> you people, um, physicists, theoretical, observational, um, thought that the universe was slowing down and you're trying to measure the, uh, the stuff in the universe that would cause it to slow down. Uh, unexpectedly, you find out it's speeding up. Mm -hmm. And so, and then that leads to other universes. Why does that lead to other universes with different properties. And by different it's, properties, do you mean different rules of physics? What do you mean different potentially, properties? Potentially, potentially. So it, um, it's indirect, where would universe it's indirect be? evidence for a multiverse. So what is a multiverse? Yeah, define that. Okay. And where would, it, where would another universe be? So <laughs> Go on, outside sorry. of ours. <laughs> what does that mean? It, well, it can, be, it can mean several different things. For one, Okay, so what is a multiverse? Well, I'll back up. There are different levels of a multiverse, but the most basic, that's not, I don't, I don't think And this is your area of expertise? Yeah, I guess okay. so. Yeah, yeah. All right, so go on. Um, so when we look out into space, there's a maximum distance that we can see. Let's say we're at the center of a circle, and we look out in all directions on the sky. We point our telescopes and we collect light. There's a maximum distance that we can see in principle. And that distance is set by the speed of light, okay? Light travels with a finite speed. So if a galaxy on the circumference of this, this horizon started traveling towards us at the beginning of the universe. The universe, our, our Big Bang happened about nearly 14 billion years ago. So say there's some light that's set out from, from a patch of the sky 14 billion years ago and it's been traveling towards us for 14 billion years. That can cover a maximum distance, okay? You can't see beyond this, this horizon because any objects that exist outside of this horizon, their light might be on its way to us, but it hasn't yet reached us. It takes time for light to travel. So we have this horizon around us, but nobody really thinks that 
space just suddenly ends like the, no one thinks there's an edge yeah yeah yeah, yeah, oh. yeah well yeah. that makes sense i mean that's yeah. the same way it is around here you it, can only see so far you can only see so far when you're on the beach you're not like shocked that a ship comes <laughs> right over well, the come horizon from? Right? right but let me ask you one question before we go too mm -hmm. fast though so if we're expanding it's not like if we hung out another million years and someone else had this conversation we would see more because we're going away at the same do you understand my well, question? Well, our, our horizon has been growing. It has been More growing. light has been coming in, and it, the horizon has been growing. But things are changing now because the nature of the expansion is changing. So I think in, in, in about like a trillion years, the only galaxies we'll actually see will be those that we are bound to, like in our local group, oh, okay. because all the others are going actually going to get pushed so far by this repulsive gravity of, of the vacuum they're going to get pushed away from us with a, a with an accelerated years. rate so eventually everything's sort of like all these galaxies are going to get swept out and and inside our horizon we're only going to see the galaxies that we're like bound to so, so we, astronomers then are going to have like a completely different version of cosmology unless we can pass this all down we live at a very special time that's what we're going to so you would think if you were observing then that your horizon was less even though it may be more, you just wouldn't be able to see more. Okay, so where were we? <laughs> so you have a limited horizon, you were saying. So 14 yeah. billion years, light yeah, travels well, We can actually see and nobody close thinks that it, to, that I mean, in principle, we can see to 46 billion years. We can't quite see that far. We can really see back to the, the cosmic microwave background radiation because before then the universe was opaque and light couldn't travel freely. It was t constantly absorbed by particles and so on. But um, but the reason why it, I said it's like 46 billion years to, to the edge of our horizon is because the universe expands as well. So like let's say light set out over here and as the universe expands that, that light is traveling towards us but the universe is also expanding. So ultimately over the 14 billion years since the Big Bang, light that, that we can see coming from the furthermost edge has really travel the distance of like 46 billion light oh, years. I think I understand that. Just the, you know, when you just factor in the expansion, if it was still, it would be 14 billion Right, well, the years. sheet of paper is expanding. Yes, the, the whole thing is expanding, right. right. So, so the, 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 the key point is that what we can see is limited. It's finite. It's huge, but, it, but, it, but it's a finite part. But nobody ever believes that space time just suddenly ends and there's an edge and you just like fall off the end of the world there no one believes that well, it goes don't. off it, it carries on it, it carries on beyond that um horizon but and and it might and the, and our universe might be infinite we, we try to study the geometry of our universe and it does look like it might have an, an infinite it might, it might have a, a flat euclidean geometry which is a three-dimensional it version. might be flat it probably is. That's what I was it's very close to flat, okay? Um, if it is exactly flat, it'll have an infinite volume. If it has a different kind of geometry called open or hyperbolic, it'll still have an infinite volume. It's only if the universe, if, if the space time, if the space like curves back on itself like the surface of a ball, that would be like a closed geometry and that would have a finite volume. But we still might be seeing just a tiny little part of a, a much bigger sphere, okay? So let's get to, the, so how does this get to multiverses? So, so, we so, can so in see a very four. basic sense, we expect there to be other galaxies out there. We yeah, expect something them to be, we can see. Yeah, so, so, we, so let's call this, this the, the space within this horizon our observable universe. There might be tons of other patches that are the same sizes of our observable universe all in this connected space time. And with the same physics, maybe just different histories, so diff slightly different. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why would that be a multiverse? Why isn't it part of our universe we can't see? It's, Are you saying they're separated? It's a so multiverse in the sense that it's beyond our observable horizon. So we, we can never get, we can't get there. So there's Brian's universe, right? Yes. The observable universe that yes. I'm in. Yes. And there's maybe Delia's universe. Well, and my but I can't ego. see. I, I yeah, can't yeah. see you. We and can't you, send a light signal to each other. And you can't see so, me, and I can't see you. Yeah. But you should. But what's in between the two of us? more with more observable universes so it's just maybe stuff, stuff we can't number. see in maybe in one connected so it's space one time. place with different universes yes that's the okay, level so one, one multiverse that's oh. the easiest most uncontroversial maybe we should stop kind of that. multiverse oh great <laughs> all right um, but then you could have like so so let's think of this in in 
two dimensions. Okay, we'll forget about yeah, three please, dimensions. So, so imagine that that sheet of paper that you're holding is the universe and that it just extends out for infinity. Then there are going to be an infinite number of observable, of O regions or observable universes on that sheet. But that sheet was spawned from the same beginning, it's the same, it has the same basic physics. There'll be differences that happen accidentally, um, like uh, the, the sort of density fluctuations that give rise to galaxies will be a little bit different in different regions, but, but generally it'll be the same physics. But what if I now say that there's a process where you don't only have that sheet, you have another sheet. It's a whole other colour, and things are much more different on that other sheet. Maybe there are more dimensions. How many levels, how many multiverse levels do you think there are? There, there are probably three or four. They, oh, okay, so you're not going to say like and, 20. And then, no, no, no. So, okay, so we've done level two, but these well, are things that are mathematically based? Because well, you won't be, this is something that you're not going to find an experimental physicist to take this on and try and observe it, right? Like Einstein, well, his, was, his predictions were observed. Um, mm -hmm. This prediction is not going to be observed. Is that correct? Well, well, well yeah, people will try. Okay, so, How so, could you so, possibly so observe? Let's go away from this flash sheet of paper because, okay. now, because now that's maybe it's served its purpose. Maybe it's even been more confusing. But let's imagine. Imagine now you have a, a pot of water, okay? But this water is really the vacuum, okay? And it's growing exponentially fast. It's it has a, a doubling time every split second. It, the volume of this water doubles. And just like um, in a pot of boiling water, a bubble of water vapor can emerge. Okay, there's like a phase transition within this this vacuum that's expanding. A bubble universe can form. Okay. And that transfer, there's this potential energy in the vacuum, in this expanding vacuum, there's this transfer of energy in a bubble nucleus, and the bubble itself grows. And that nucleation of the bubble we could, um, is sort of analogous to the, the, the Big Bang for us, okay? But it's possible that there are other bubbles that nucleate outside of that bubble. Like okay? a pot of water. Constantly, exactly. constantly bubbling up. Exactly, like this boiling pot. You don't just get one bubble, you get multiple bubbles. But with, with the, this analogy, sort of, um, you'd have to try and imagine this boiling pot of water expanding. Okay, forget oh, about the, the walls time. of the pot. At the same time as bubbles are coming in, uh, the water is expanding and there's always room for more bubbles to form. Okay? So each of these bubbles, if we think of this expanding space time, this vacuum that's expanding, and bubbles nucleate within it, each of those bubbles are different universes. And the laws of physics can be somewhat different within those bubbles, depending. Um, and that's level three? Uh, but it's separate I, 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 from level I, I, I would, one. I would say that multiple bubbles to me is like a level two oh, okay. universe. I guess oh. the, the completely different, if you had different parts, that would be a, a quantum cosmology. Uh, okay, getting to <laughs> too many levels. <laughs> All right. So, but, but that is totally different than the level one where here I am in my universe, here you are in your universe, and we can't see each other. Right. That's right. just kind of like more of what we are. Yeah, yeah. There's no mystery there's no, there. It's just yeah. further than I can see. Right. Okay, so that Even in principle. But right. there's no reason to, to think that, that the galaxies don't go on beyond our observable horizon. Why, why right, wouldn't right. they? So that totally makes sense. And we're running out of time here. Okay. And we have a ton more to talk about. So maybe you'll come back sometime. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the bubbling pot thing yeah. is a totally foreign concept. Where does that thought process come from? Do you understand my question now? Yes. Who thought of a bubbling yeah. pot of universes? Well, when, when Alan Guth came up with the theory of inflation, so he had this, this state, this vacuum. Vacuum is what you get when you take everything, like take you and I and the tables and the chairs, everything out the room. But the, the quantum mechanical vacuum is actually filled with, with, with stuff. Okay? You, can't, you never really get nothing. This. You get so nothing is not nothing. Nothing is not nothing. It's really complicated. It's sort of like the DNA of our universe. And from that nothing, you pretty much get everything that's, that's available in the universe. Like if you, if you had a vacuum, you would have um, virtual particles that will pop in and out of existence for tiny amounts of time. And they, they give the vacuum some energy density. And these, these things are actually measurable. It's not just science fiction. 
Okay. Like if, if an electron and its antimatter particle, a positron, um, pop out of the vacuum, they just suddenly appear from nothing, they'll live for like a tiny fraction of a second and then they'll disappear again. But they've been observed, right? But that, th those kind of vacuum fluctuations and, and the effects that it has on, on atoms and so on has actually been observed. It's, it's well observed. Very. Um, so... Where was I with the vacuum? So where you're going with this is that, let me oh, ask. Oh, 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 yes, go ahead. So uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, the guth, is that what yes. you just said? So as Einstein's had predictions that were later observed, the bubbling multiverse is actually a prediction of, it just ends up being a prediction of the current thinking, such as, you know, um, not that you know, but I don't know if I'm making any sense, but there were predictions that followed from Einstein's mm -hmm. original prediction, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> okay. So there's more to it than like, oh, well, we've just observed the diffraction or deflection, and then we observed the next thing that got observed, which I can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. But that was part of what the theory was. It's just mm -hmm. further on. So mm -hmm. you're saying that the bubbling pot of multiverse, it's not so far out because it actually relates back to... Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 built, it's built on general relativity and, and particle physics. Right. And particle physics, yeah, it didn't come from nothing. So you have a state, of, you have a vacuum that's got a lot of energy. So, so the current energy density of the universe, this cosmological constant which is causing the accelerated expansion, it, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of energy per cubic centimeter. It's very, very small. Um, but it's enough to cause the universe to accelerate on, on, on the whole. But going back to early times, basically, you said, well, what if there's a lot of energy in, in every cubic centimeter of empty space? And, and what he found was that while this energy is constant, the volume, the, the universe ex undergoes exponential expansion. It's a solution to Einstein's equation. And this, this exponential expansion, Guth realized, that it could solve problems that were, were, had plagued uh, the Big Bang Theory. They were in contradictions with the theory, but there were things that just had to be assumed and special initial conditions. And Guth realized that if the very early universe underwent this exponential expansion, which could be caused by having a high energy density, constant field, okay, this, this vacuum with this constant, very high energy density, then the universe would ex expand exponentially. Uh, it would solve all these problems of, of launching the Big Bang. And, but somehow this process has to end. He called the process inflation. And somehow it has to end. And he, he said, well, there's a phase transition, that there's this energy in, in, in the field, um, this potential energy, and it gets transferred into the energy of particles and radiation. And that was the Big Bang. But what he found, what, what people found was that trying to end inflation was quite tricky. And you can get a, in some cases you can describe it such that a bubble is formed, a bubble is nucleated. Um, but what but, but Alex Vilenkin showed was that once inflation starts, it doesn't end everywhere at once. So when inflation ends, it's like a local part of that huge volume that ends inflation and has a big bang, but elsewhere inflation continues and other big bangs can subsequently happen. So that's where the multiple bubbles come from. So you just imagine you have this expanding space, it gives rise to a universe here, but it can give rise to a universe here and it can give rise to a universe there. And the stuff, this expanding sea between all these universes is just expanding dramatically faster. <laughs> wow. So. That's amazing that you've thought about all this. So you have to come back, though, because I'm sure I have a lot of other questions, which I do. I'm just I'm mind boggled now. So let me thank you for being here. And just before we wrap up, out of all these, you understand all of these different um, scenarios. And I guess I asked at the beginning, is there one that makes the most sense? So is there one that people, the, between the we can't see each other, multi one, I'm sorry, level one multiverse and the level two and the level three, are they, do they all have equal footing? No. Okay. No. The level one is, is the most basic. It's hard to see how you get around that. Right. So okay. We, okay. So, and and that, that brings in a host of interesting consequences. If, if 
But they follow from each other. But they follow from, okay. yeah. And, and I think almost all working cosmologists believe that the universe underwent some period of inflation. It matches, we can't get into it now, but there's a ton of experimental data supporting inflation. And the multiverse is a prediction of inflation. It's not like you have a multiverse theory. It falls out of the theory of inflation. Right, that's it's what a I was consequence trying to get together of with inflation. That's what I meant It's not when a I was theory by itself. It's, it's a consequence. It's a consequence it's of inflation, so. which is also... Something that you might yeah. not be comfortable thinking about, but yeah. it happens to be a consequence. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Delia Perlov, thank you for being here. Um, Pleasure. 502 thank you Conversations. For me. Her book is Cosmology for the Curious. I have read it twice, written with Alex Belenkin. Correct. Correct. All right. And you are, you do research and you have taken, you do also teach cosmology. Yes. And ast I was going to say astrology, astronomy. <laughs> astronomy. I have taught. At the moment, I'm not teaching astronomy, but I have. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank Delia Perlov. Thank oh. you. Thanks. You're welcome. 502 Conversations. As I said, my guest has been Delia Perlov. If you found this conversation interesting and you'd like to hear more, you can reach out to me at 502conversations at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.